guys and welcome to our podcast number four. Uh, with us here we have Yan. I'm not going to say the full name because I re- always uh, mess it up. So Yan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Hannah. Nice to be with you on this podcast again. All right. So uh, let me jump to the first question that we have. So recently we have seen that uh, Bitcoin will be on the Lightning ne- Network and that will be available to uh, 400,000 storefronts. Um, so with Bitcoin uh, as a monetary network, the finance industry is going to face a major disruption. So, and, and I give you an example, right? Because now that we are traveling, the main thing that comes to my mind is money exchange. But if you tell me that I can go to a country and I don't have to worry about the money exchange and I can just use a wallet to make a payment for any product or anything, that really solves a lot of my problems. Okay. Also, what this means is this cryptocurrency will not be viewed as an uh, investment asset. It's going to be much more used in the daily life. So solely uh, from a disruption point of view, what do you have to say to finance incumbents such as um, Citibank or UOB? I think it's interesting you know, having built like detailed case studies around Nokia, Kodak, uh, BlackBerry, uh, and a few others. It is, you know, how, how does it go so wrong, right? You know, at one point, we were discussing that earlier today in the team, weren't we, that, uh, that Nokia were unstoppable, right? You know, in the early 2000s, the idea that Nokia would be dead within a decade was just ludicrous, right? Uh, and the idea that they were killed by Apple would be, have been even more ludicrous. If you told someone that in 2003, 2004, they would have laughed in your face, right? They would have laughed in your face. There's no, and so what I'm trying to, the reason why I'm being a bit dramatic about that is I'm trying to draw attention to the fact that what we think is going on and what we think the future is going to be is not at all what the future is going to be. Like, it's not even close. It's not even remotely close. And the person who knew the least about what the future was going to be was the CEO of Nokia, right? Was the CEO of BlackBerry. And and so I think humility is essential to prevent delusion. And what's hap- what happens, I think, especially, and this is, you know, where I think the first, okay, the first thing to break it down is you step one, and this is really a default practice at Leaderpreneur, start with understanding the avocat reality. We are in a world that is accelerating, it's very volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous with magical technology being created every day. And this is a new kind of reality. It's, it's, it's not the same old reality as you knew in the 80s or 90s, but a bit faster with a bit shinier graphics. It's fundamentally different. And so what that means is your ability to anticipate and predict the future is, is, is non-existent. And furthermore, the belief that you can predict the future is even more dangerous because you end up believing your own, your own bullshit, basically. And I, and I think that's what ends up happening, that companies believe that they're going to get it. They believe that they're doing the right things. And in a way, they are doing all the right things, but at the same time, they're doing all the wrong things as well. So I think there's this basic principled practice of humility, what, what I call epistemic humility, to, to, it's not, you're not just being humble per se, but related to epistemology, the study of knowledge, you're demonstrating humility in the fact that you don't know. And the most valuable thing that you can do is to truly get that you don't get it and you ain't going to get it. And that instead you're going to have to rely on others to help you find the way. And so you know, in talking sort of the leaders of these organizations, and that's, that's what I think is, is a difference that makes an enormous difference. Practicing humility at the senior leadership level, epistemic humility, to building a real culture around that, it is going to be able to enable these organizations to navigate through this. Without that humility, you're going to fall into the death spiral and you will die. But again, Jan, when you're talking about humility, I, I don't think people walk around realizing whether they are humble or not, right? So how would you advise someone to bring in that epistemic humility that you're talking about? Yeah. It's, I, well, I think that it's, it's about the living practice, right? And I, I think this sort of overconfidence that we're getting it and we're doing the right thing, that's, I think, the, 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 what's dangerous about it. That there isn't this genuine fear There isn't this genuine awareness that there is just actually much, much more out there and that there is a, so that when I, so when I see a lot of the, like the bravado and the theater and the showmanship, right. And you know, you see 
like the, the the big finance guys, we have this accelerator and we're doing this program and we've got this and this and wow, wow, wow and we're doing everything right. But what, what happens there is you can kind of get blinded by the lights. And so one of the things that I think is useful is to really find opinions that fundamentally challenge you and to bring them into the conversation from the periphery. Disruptive innovation never happens in the core. It always happens in the periphery. It is impossible for financial institutions to innovate the technologies and um, ways of working and business models that will disrupt them. It ain't going to happen because the core exists to preserve the core. It's going to come from the periphery. It's going to come from somewhere else. And it's going to come from somewhere you're not paying attention to. So having a disruptor radar in place is a good example to me of a tangible way of having epistemic humility, that you're aware of who the disruptive threats are and you're taking them seriously. No, um, BlackBerry and Nokia did not take Apple seriously. They lacked humility, right? They didn't understand that they were actually on the path to death, right? And uh, and, and it's well well known that at the beginning they were basically they were well they literally were laughing at Apple, right? And and Android. So that that sort of um, there's two elements there that having that disruptor radar there in place, being aware of what are being able to say this is a disruptive threat. This is a disruptive threat. They're coming from the periphery. They're in places we don't know. Um, working very hard to not be too blinded by your own bullshit, actively seeking out differences of opinion, recognizing that it's not going to come from you. And then I, th I think, I think thirdly, just having that element of, um, wanting to go out there and, and finding those new technologies that will fundamentally challenge your business model. If you look at Blockbuster, for example, um, a lot of their income is very significant part of their income and a large portion of their profitability came from late fees. And so because maybe, I don't know, I can't remember the exact numbers now from the case study I built, but it was like maybe at least 15, 20%, maybe even 30% of revenue and income was from late fees. Right. And so that means you're never ever going to move to a streaming service because then there's no more late fees. Right. So you have to kind of bring in this understanding that you're going to have to disrupt yourself. Uh, and, and at a very foundational level, it's going to mean letting go of everything you know and doing something fundamentally new. Okay, so let's go back to earlier what you said about um, you need to have your disrupt disruptor radar on, right? So as someone who is new to um, learning about disruption, what's the first thing I need to, to do? Or what's the first thing I need to embed in my culture so that I, I'm always aware of, a, uh, of the disruption happening around me? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think it's about connecting that good intention to a practice and making it something that is consistently done. It's not a one-off thing. It's about to build a culture is about repetition, behaviors, values, and, uh, and, and repeating these things regularly. So for example, in my mind, that could be a monthly conversation for half an hour where everyone presents in one minute, one disruptor they've heard about in the last month that is relevant to the business. And you know, what is the threat? Why is it relevant? And how can we respond? Right? Could be as simple as that. But but do you run that conversation over 12 months every month? So I think it's about making things less complex. And so it's not about necessarily creating a very big innovation program that does lots of clever, complex things. It's more about building a discipline about the way in which you recognize disruption and i think what happens too much is disruption becomes flavor of the month people talk about it and then you know three months later there's something else that's important right and so you're not really keeping your eyes on the prize and there's things coming in and it's going to kill you right but you're paying attention to other things right right i mean it, it, in in the nokia case study nokia's peak year of revenue was 2009 and they died in 2013 that's 16 quarters right how many of those quarters were they saying we need to kill Apple or, or we're going to die, right? I mean, in another reality, Nokia becomes Apple, right? What Apple became. So they missed that boat. But every quarter, um, they were looking at different priorities. Oh, there's this, there's that, regulation, supply chain, blah, 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 blah. So the senior management are distracted. They're not paying attention to the threat that's going to kill them. And they don't take it seriously because they lack humility and awareness, right? And so they're doing the things, but they're, doing the, they're, they're fundamentally doing the wrong things. And because they're blinded by their own bullshit, we are Nokia, we are the ones who essentially almost in, well, invented mobile phones, right? How could we possibly get it wrong? And so 
this whole blur um, prevents you from seeing what's really going on in reality until it's far too late. All right, so um, let's say someone was able to get out of the blur, right? And then they are able to see the disruption coming on. So this, is, this comes to my next question, which is about Amazon, right? So we see that Amazon is failing at delivery drones, and we can see that Google and Walmart is already picking up the paces, and they might even hit the market faster than what Amazon planned. And so that's one example. Another example is myself. Um, as a copywriter, I do see there are AI copywriting um, softwares out there, but... It, which is eventually going to disrupt so many other things that I do, right? So um, I know there's a disruption there, and um, I, I can either go and learn how to use it. But until now, I haven't, I haven't, go, I haven't um, mastered it, or I haven't gone and purchased any of those software. So in terms of seeing a disruption or seeing an innovation, how fast should a company run towards it and embed it or succeed at it? I think the right way to answer this question is to realize that what matters is getting the timing right rather than being fast. So you can be too fast and it, you know, there's other priorities maybe that should have been focused on. And, and so you arrive too early, you're too early to market um, you're with your idea or whatever else and it doesn't work out. Uh, obviously you can also be too slow and then that's too dangerous. And so I think it's really about focusing on that conversation of right timing. Um, that being said, it's again, I think about in order to get the timing right, you have to really continue the conversation with the subject matter. So for example, for you, if you're using the example of the AI, it's about, it's on your radar now, right? Okay. This is coming, you know, AI is already writing copy and will probably only get better at it going into the future. Right? So in order to make sure you have your timing, right, it's about paying attention to the timing and seeing how it's evolving. Now, that's only the first step. The challenge becomes when do you actually decide to do things differently, right? There's a famous example of if you put a pot in a, a frog in a, a pot of water and you gently heat it up, it will, it will um, stay in that pot of water until it per per perishes because there's no sharp temperature change to make it think, hey, this is dangerous, let's get out. And so in order to do that, I guess what, what's looking for is that kind of... Um, that sharp shock that's enabling uh, you to break out of your bubble, to break out of your consciousness and say, okay, like, like we're going to do this. Like Nokia really mobilized and saying, guys, this is not a drill. This is war. It's do or die. We move now as one and we take this seriously and you, you, you re-energize. And so I think that's, I, I, there's, there's so many different ways to approach that, but I, I think in general it's, it's, it can also be dangerous to be conversing with the subject matter because you don't realize that it's actually changing, right? Like if you if you look at, for example, crypto, right? We've been talking about crypto for four or five years now, haven't we? But you know, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, crypto, oh yeah, crypto, oh yeah, crypto. But each year it becomes more and more and more and yet there is no action being taken, right? In some places. Of course there are in others, right? So my thoughts that come to my mind would be maybe enjoy the crises when they come. So when there's a crisis, that can give you a rallying call to act and say, we're gonna really go for this now, right? And I, and I think a good example of that to use is, is, is the Ukraine crisis at the moment is an enormous awakening opportunity for Europe, not only obviously in dealing with the immediate threat of Russia, but um, the, the transition to a renewable energy economy, right? To unify Europe and to um, energize its people again, to to build out new technologies, all these kinds of things. So they're taking the crisis, and crises are always coming along in everywhere, right? The world is always ending. So, so mm -hmm. being being able to keep your head and recognize that you can use, you should use those crises to mobilize for action. Um, so you're paying attention to the threat, and you're looking for a moment that will allow you to say, "Now we do a sharp and decisive turn." And then when so, but when it comes, then you've got to go for it. And that's where courage, courageous leadership is required, and decisive leadership. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think that was, for example, again, using the Russia situation, because that's just in, in, in our minds at the moment, that's you know, something that Putin clearly underestimated was the resolve of the response, right? It, I think Putin thought that the West would just keep watching, slap a few sanctions in and not go for it. But the, what they've done is they've done this whoom, massive change, right? 
So what if, what if Nokia had done that, right? What if Apple had launched a, you know, the next iteration of the iPhone and Nokia said, you know, we are now 100% mobilizing to destroy this, right? And that was nothing else mattered. Nothing else mattered. This was it, right? And you deploy your talent, your money, technology, resources, and it's, it's just a do or, and you are able through your leadership to create this do or die reality. Then at least you have another, a roll of the dice to truly do something different. Right? Nokia was doomed. It was inevitable. At least this way, you have a sense of leveraging the crisis to try and do, fundamentally change things. All right, Jan, those were some powerful um, insights that you shared today. And um, just to recap on what we've talked about so far, we talk about disruption and how do we bring in the conversation of disruption in a company and uh, as you said, the example of having probably a monthly um, conversation about it and also knowing about the right time on when do we actually go and um, I would say attack the disruption, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, obviously all of this is within the, 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 the obvious brackets of it's never easy. Uh, and um, But yeah, I think that there's, maybe that's a nice way to summarize it, isn't it? One is about being engaged with the conversation, right? First, you've got to engage, build a disruptor, di uh, build a, dis a disruptor radar, be aware of what's going on, right? So you're taking it seriously enough. You're demonstrating the epistemic humility that you realize you don't know and uh, and you need to go and find out. And um, and then secondly, when the moment comes for a decisive action, take it, take it. And that's why I think it's important to be a leaderpreneur because in general, managers are too afraid and that, that makes them weak and it makes them unable to deal with the volatility and challenges of this day and age. Managerial thinking is too focused on efficiency. You're too worried about, oh no, my efficiency will be lost. It's true. It's true. Your efficiency will be lost, but um, so will maybe the viability of your entire company and career, right? So I think it's about having that courage to understand when the right moment is here. Uh, the ancient Greeks would use the term kairos versus chronos. Chronos is ordinary time. Kairos is extraordinary time the moment where a difference makes a difference. And when you leap into action, if you're like an agile warrior, for example, or strategos, you are decisive in that because you know that this is the moment and you, you give your all to win that moment and to change the course of your destiny. All right, yeah. So on this note of um, giving our all and ch changing the course of destiny, uh, we're going to end this podcast. So thank you so much for being with us. And thank you to our viewers if you have watched uh, this video so far. And we'll see you all next week. Anything from you, Yang? No. Have a lovely afternoon. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Lead Entrepreneur's YouTube channel to get your weekly updates.